thank y'all for having me and for being here. I will say as a, a professor, the noon hour is every professor's worst nightmare to have to keep people awake because they're either hungry or they've just eaten and then they're sleepy. So I will try. If I can keep 18-year-olds awake for an hour and 15 minutes in a history class, hopefully we can, we can get through this together. Um, I would like to have Ro uh, Robin stand up very quickly and wave because um, all the pictures you're going to see today are his. <laughs> And I would also like to, if you don't mind, let me um, introduce uh, some of my family that came down today from Talladega. My mother's here, if you want to just hold up your hand and wave. Um, Beverly Pope, my aunt Sydney Thompson, and my nieces um, Hannah and Rebecca McClendon, who were kind enough to take a day off of school today to be here. So I really appreciate that sacrifice because I know that was tough. So after we did make it legitimate, they're going to go to Dexter Avenue Baptist Church and that Museum of Alabama and the Capitol and the first White House of the Confederacy while they're here. So there is a lot of educational um, stuff going on for them today as well. So um, y'all know my, my personal background. Um, um, how I came to the book, um, uh, I want to let y'all know this up front, and then we'll get started with the book itself and the black belt. Um, the I had talked to uh, the University of Alabama Press about doing a book about the black belt because, as director of the Center for the Study of the Black Belt, the most common question I received was, what book can I read to find out about the black belt? And there's not one. And I thought, you know, this region of the state that's so unique and has played such a large role in the history of Alabama and um, you know we need I need something that I can give to people and say here read this okay um, and that didn't exist so I approached the University of Alabama Press about that and at the same time Black Belt Treasures in Camden Alabama which we'll talk about when we get to the end of the presentation a little more um, had approached the press about wanting to do a book for their 10th anniversary celebration which was October 2015 and so just great timing on everybody's part um, and then Robin had done the uh, calendars for the Black Belt Heritage Area for several years, so he had some great pictures already of the region. So it was just a good combination of everything coming together at just the right time. And the book came out in October 2015, last October, um, and by March of 2016 it was in its third printing. So it's been very, very well received, and we've been really grateful for that. And um, uh, people have have appreciated the book f for various reasons, but so far all the feedback's been been very positive. So um, I hope you enjoy the presentation today and the book as well. And if, if you do purchase a book, of course, Robin and I will be honored to sign that for you after the event. So we'll, we'll be around to do that. Okay, so we'll get started. Um, Visions of the Black Belt, a cultural survey of the heart of Alabama. And of course, we are in the Black Belt today. Um, and so, but a lot of people have misconceptions about what the black belt actually is. And the way I'm going to do the presentation, like I said, all the pictures are from the book. Um, I'm going to give just some information about the black belt, and then I'm going to read some excerpts from the book as well. Okay, so um, obviously, if you look on the at the map on your left, the um, but the purple line more or less that's arcing right through the middle of the state is the black belt, named that of course for the black soil, um, and. We chose to include 19 counties in the book um, only because that's what the Black Belt Heritage Area used. And some of those are partially Black Belt, but you can't cut a county in half. So that's why we went ahead and just went with 19 counties. Sort of that the more the merrier idea, right, to get a little bit more out of it. So um, that's what we chose to go with. Um, and the black soil in the Black Belt is very fertile soil, um, great for growing cotton. Um, if you had depleted your cotton on the East Coast on your plantation in Virginia or the Carolinas um, and you're looking for new land, then you're going to head into um, the Black Belt. And so um, that's what gives the area its name. Um, and because of that, of course, to grow cotton you need um, to make it profitable prior to the Civil War, you had to have an enslaved African pop American population. And so um, a lot of people think that the name Black Belt comes due to the demographics of the region, which are a direct result of the soil, but the, the name actually refers to the soil, um, the soil itself. Okay. Um, and of course, those are the 19 counties that we included um, there on the right as well. Um, from the book, 
um, the introduction. Perhaps nowhere else in Alabama has the social and cultural history of a region been so tied to its soil. Native Americans mainly used the region for hunting, burning off the young cedar trees on the prairie to create open hunting ranges. Some of the first Europeans in the region, the French and the Spanish, were drawn to the area's outposts to the Choctaw and Creek tribes that inhabited the area. And though early white visitors to the region thought the area infertile due to the lack of trees on the prairie, planters from the east soon realized the error of their ways and began flocking to the grasslands and cane breaks of the region, cutting down trees and cane along the riverbanks and plowing up the prairie to plant cotton. Permanent white settlers began moving into the area at the turn of the 19th century, and Alabama fever was in full swing by the 1820s as white settlers from Virginia and the Carolinas settled the new southwest to grow the one crop that had worn out their land on the east, which was cotton. Okay. So here's a great map of Alabama in 1860. Uh, the larger the circle, the larger the population. Um, and if you, it's pretty obvious where the Black Belt is, right? Because that was the center of the state and that was where you wanted to be if you were white and if you were a planner. Um, the blue shading is the um, percentage of the population that was enslaved, and the red shading is the percentage of the population that was white. Okay, so um, you've got Mobile, you've got um, the Tennessee Valley, and then of course um, the main population center is um, the Black Belt. If you looked at a map of Alabama today, it would be completely reversed. Okay, and. Um, Throughout this talk, we'll, we'll talk about why. I will also mention that if you happen to look at a county-by-county county breakdown of the state of Alabama for the 2016 election, you'll also be able to see the black belt as well, um, except for Jefferson County, which was blue. Um, the rest of the state, except for the, the black belt, um, was, was red, but there is a blue stripe through the black belt um, as well. The rich black soil atop the white impermeable chalk created an economic and political powerhouse that cut a horizontal swath, swath across central Alabama. With their wealth and power, black belt planters led the charge for secession from the Union, in part to protect the slave-based economy, and they saw their capital, Montgomery, become the capital of their newly formed Confederacy in 1861. But within four years, the economic system they depended upon, built on the fertile soil of the black belt and the forced labor of slaves, was gone. And what this is going to create um, is um, tenant farming and sharecropping, which is going to come to occupy most of the, uh, the, the people living in the Black Belt after the Civil War. The Civil War created a large class of freed laborers who had little education and no money. The skill that the freedmen and women possessed was farming, specifically cotton farming, and there was a lot of land that needed cultivating, which was still owned by a handful of white landowners. Some from the south and some newly arrived from the north. There was also a newly impoverished group of white yeoman farmers who had been left destitute by the fortunes of war. These blacks and whites had labor to offer but needed housing, land, tools, and food. The landowners had no cash to pay workers but had land, the tools used by their former slaves, and housing in the form of slave cabins. And thus was born the system of tenant farming and sharecropping that would dominate the black belt economy for almost a century. And we wanted to make sure with the book that we did tell the entire story of the Black Belt, because most of the time when people think Black Belt, um, they think large plantation houses, and the Black Belt certainly has a wonderful concentration of those, and a lot of them still remain. But like I said, most people did not live in those houses, especially after the Civil War. Most people lived in what today we would refer to as sharecropper cabins or tenant farmer cabins. Um, so we have one on the left that's in Perry County. Um, on a farm in Perry County. And then the house on the right is also in Perry County. It's in Marion um, in the main downtown. The point of this book was not to glorify the Black Belt, okay, um, but to show the Black Belt as it has been and as it is today, okay. And so to tell that entire story, we have to look at the good and the bad. Um, and we do that throughout the book. Um, but the sharecropper cabins are kind of close to my heart, and I think it's because they were such an important part of the history of of the living history, right, of the people of the Black Belt, um, but they tend to be overlooked and seen as disposable. And I have been driving back and forth from either Marion to Montgomery or Auburn or Livingston to Montgomery or Auburn now for about 18 years, more or less. And over that time, I've always had a few little sharecroppers' cabins I've kept an eye on, and I've seen them all disappear in the last 10 to 15 years. And so for something that was so common in the 
the roadsides and in the countryside. Um, you know, they get in people's way. The, the thing that really did most of them in was um, when the price of scrap metal went up, all those uh, sharecroppers' cabins had metal roofs on them. The houses aren't occupied, and so somebody said, I'm going to scrap that metal. So they take the metal off the roof. They get $15 for it. Okay, and within two years, that structure is going to collapse. Okay, buildings will last a long time if they've got a roof on them, but once the roof's gone, that's it. Um, and so I, I had Robin um, go take pictures of lots of these, and I knew maybe only one or two would make it into the book. But my ulterior motive was for us to create um, a, a scrapbook, basically, um, a visual archive of these structures. The, there is one other one that appears in the book as well. There, there were two at that site where we took the other one that's in the book. Um, two weeks after we took the pictures, one of them was gone. And about the time the book was published, a friend who, of mine who, had, who bought the book was driving past the one that was still remaining that's, that showed up in the book, and she saw they'd taken the roof off. And she said, well, what are y'all doing? Y'all can't take the roof off. The building's going to collapse. And they said, oh, we're burning it tomorrow. And she said, but you can't. It's in a book. And she ran back out to the car, and she got the book, and she held it up. And they're like, we want it gone. And she said, sure enough, I drove back into work the next morning. Um, well, home from work, sorry, the next day. And they had burned it during the day. Um, and so all that's left of that is this visual archive that we were able to create of just a handful of these structures. But again, so many people in the Black Belt called these home um, for, for decades. Um, and so one thing we wanted to do, even if they didn't show up in the book, um, Robin still has the pictures of them. And I've said, make sure you label them and give them to the archives. So archives, y'all hear that. Um, I told him to do it. If he doesn't, You'll have to talk to him about it. Okay. All right. For about the last 50 years, we have been told what's wrong with the Black Belt. Okay. And there's a lot wrong. Um, it's got high rates of poverty, high rates of unemployment. A lot of people have referred to it as the third world, um, a part of the third world in Alabama and the United States. Okay. So we are constantly told... Um, What's wrong about it? And so one thing we wanted to do with the book, though, was help people to see that there's some beautiful things still there, okay, um, from the introduction. In many areas of the region, the attempt to see beauty in the rusting buildings, moldering houses, and tumbling bricks is all that is left to tell us what the Black Belt once was. Though people, both free and enslaved, worked for years to clear the trees and vines to create fields for cotton, when the people left, nature quickly reclaimed what had been hers for centuries. What the grasses and trees did not cover, water and occasionally fire consumed, sometimes slowly and sometimes immediately. Houses that took craftsmen years to build by cutting down trees by hand, planing the boards, mortising the walls, and splitting the cedar shakes have been lost to fire, neglect, and vandals. The vandals take what they want, usually to larger cities to be sold as architectural details for new houses of urban dwellers, and nature takes the rest. The heyday of the steamboats and the railroads is gone, and though some trains still pass through the region, they do not stop for passengers. And um, just as an aside, I kind of learned this the hard way when, when my mom wanted to come visit, and so she said, I'm going to take the train from Anniston down to come see you. And she said, she, I had to go pick her up in Meridian, Mississippi, which is about 45 minutes away. And she rode that train and she said, I passed the Livingston stop and the train didn't stop. And I was like, I know. And I had to, she was literally on the train two blocks from my house and I had to drive to Meridian, Mississippi to pick her up. So the train does not stop here anymore is definitely the case. Okay. Um, and, of course, highway routes um, have been replaced by the interstate. The major artery of the region, U.S. Highway 80, is a ghost lane that now parallels I-85 in the east. Gas stations and towns along the pre-interstate route show the decline that comes when people no longer need to stop while passing through to buy gas or eat a meal. Shuttered businesses with their collapsing roofs line U.S. Highway 80, U.S. Highway 11, and Alabama Highway 5, not to mention the countless back roads that crisscross the region. The country stores that were once the center of community life have been placed by large anonymous chain stores, and the ruins and remnants serve as a silent reminder of the losses that accompany modernity. Okay. 
Um, but at the same time, it is perhaps the slowed march toward progress that has made the Black Belt what it is today. The neglect forced on the inhabitants by poverty kept old buildings from being torn down to make way for new ones. Towns did not outgrow their boundaries. The urban renewal of the 1960s was not forced upon the region, except for Montgomery, because the declining populations meant there were no large blighted city centers. Congregations still worship in the original church buildings constructed 50, 100, 150 years ago. Antebellum homes were not torn down for strip malls, though the move away from town squares toward the highway bypasses is catching up with the Black Belt. And though buildings have been lost to neglect, abandonment, and the lack of funds for upkeep, the land has not been scraped clean of its built past by new construction. And so we decided, you know what? These are the things that make the Black Belt unique. Okay. Sure, poverty is not a good thing. Nobody wants anybody to be stuck with it. But there are some things that make up the Black Belt today that are a result of that poverty. And so let's look at those. Let's examine those. And let's preserve um, what is left behind as a result of, the uh, of that poverty. So little industrialization, um, taking what you have to make what you need, which we're going to see in several of the chapters, especially towards the end. Still a very strong connection to the land and still very much a rural small town culture. Okay, um, my husband moved to Marion, Alabama from Atlanta. Yeah, let that sink in for a minute, okay? And I'll never forget, I asked him why, you know, why would you want to move? Now, he said, well, for one thing, Judson College offered me a job. I was like, well, that's one reason to move. I said, but there's got to be something else. I mean, most people are going to look at that and they're going to say, I'm going to move from Atlanta to a place with 2,000 people, right? It's very rural. And he said, well, in Atlanta... I felt anonymous, and if something could have happened to me, and nobody would have known. He said, but in Marion, if you don't show up for church, they come find you, right? And they're going to track you down and be like, so, you weren't at church today, everything okay? You know, and he said, sure, at some level, that's a little rude, okay, but at the same time, it's so nice to know that people care and they notice, okay? And he said, the other thing is, you have to be nice to everybody in a small town because you never know who's related to who and you're going to see them again, right? So you can't have road rage when you get mad. You know, you just got to wave and smile because you're going to run into those people at the post office. And he said, there's something to be said for that um, and what that does to people as human beings. Um, and he said, yeah, they're up in your business, but that's okay right? Um, most of the time we, we assume it's because they care, right? That's why they're up in our business. So, and there are a lot of people moving to the Black Belt um, who, when they come to things in the small town, say, this is what it was like when I grew up, okay? Um, just people waving at people, people seeing people, you know, that kind of thing. And so, instead of trying to make the towns grow, when a lot of times it's just not there, it's not going to happen. Um, what we're trying to do is get people in the Black Belt to appreciate what's in the Black Belt, first of all, to take better care of it, and but then get other people to come see the Black Belt and what makes the Black Belt unique um, for themselves. Okay. And the first chapter is icons of the Black Belt. Um, Y'all know what the one on the left is? Cahaba, the columns at Cahaba, and of course the right. The Prairie Real St. Andrew's Church, right in Galleon. And um, I had some friends come visit last night, and she said, I need to buy a book for a Christmas gift. She said, but only if it's got the Little Red Church in it. And I said, it's page 14. It's got the Little Red Church in it. Okay, so um, she has a friend in Columbus, Georgia, who had seen the Little Red Church driving across the Black Belt to, um, to Mississippi, and it stuck with her. And so she wanted the book specifically um, for that. So we want to get people outside the Black Belt to come see the Black Belt, but we also want people inside the Black Belt to see the Black Belt um, and appreciate it. You know, you don't appreciate what's there, what, you, what you've grown up with, what you have, that kind of thing, okay? Um, and so we said, you know what, yeah, there's some bad stuff in the Black Belt and some bad things have happened. Um, we have the Edmund Pettus Bridge as an icon, okay? Um, the Martin Luther King uh, Memorial here in Montgomery is in the icons chapter as well, okay? So... This is not something that glosses over um, what's, what's been wrong, okay? We, we talk about it, we deal with it, we acknowledge it, okay? But at some point, we have to say, there's a lot of wrong. We're going to admit that, we're going to go with that, okay? But there's a lot of right. And so let's figure out what's right so we can get people 
in the black belt and outside the black belt to come visit and want to see um, see what's going on. Okay. Uh, chapter two, talk of the towns, uh, Greensboro on the left and Thomasville on the right. Clark County was a little bit of a stretch for black belt, but we, we went ahead and went with it anyway. Um, and what we do, we just look at all the downtowns and all the counties. Okay. Um, and we take the pictures of the courthouses, Confederate monuments included. Okay. Um, again, you work, you work with what you've got. And the towns are really what's important um, about, about the Black Belt. Okay. Um, from the introduction to Chapter 2, the towns of the Black Belt have witnessed war, segregation, poverty, sharecropping, boycotts, the civil rights movement, economic decline. But each town has had its share of rebuilding, renewal, and reconciliation. There have been revivals, weddings, parades, festivals, christenings, baptism, and Christmas tree lighting ceremonies. There have been funerals, protests, marches, arrests, rallies, and destruction. But through it all, the structures that create the towns, the buildings, the fountains, the bridges, churches, squares, parks, stores, statues, and monuments provide the citizens of the region with a sense of place and instill a sense of community that ties many people to the area. And so we look at the architecture of the past. Um, the building on the left is the Sumter County Courthouse, which is right behind my house in Livingston. And the building on the right is Magnolia Hall in Greensboro. Okay, so we do look at the architecture of the past. Um, but we also look at some of the architecture of the future. Okay, this house is in the black belt. Um, it's got a nice kind of Frank Lloyd Wright-ish look to it. A little bit later, obviously, I know. Don't, don't, Mr. Gamble, don't call me out on that, please. Uh, Bob Gamble was here, so. Um, but this is in York, Alabama, um, which if y'all know anything about York, this is the last thing you would ever expect to see in York. Okay, but it's a great house. Um, it's been restored and then, of course, the Black Belt also has the wonderful work of the Auburn University Rural Studio, um, which is featured in the book as well. Again, a group of people who are coming from outside the Black Belt um, to work on a problem in the Black Belt, but they did it right in that they worked with the people in the Black Belt. Because one thing that's been an issue is everybody wants to come in and save the Black Belt from itself, um, but they don't bother to actually talk to the people there while they do it. And the, the Rural Studio has done a very good job of working with the people and working with what the Black Belt has um, to, make that, to make that a reality. Uh, the third chapter is churches. Uh, the church on the left is um, the Methodist Church in Livingston. Um, the church on the right is Elizabeth Church, also Sumter County. Um, there are also a lot of Episcopal churches in here. Somebody mentioned that to me, and they said, why are there so many Episcopal churches in here? And I said, when the author's Episcopalian, you get a lot of Episcopal churches. So um, we had those. Uh, but the church on the right, Elizabeth Presbyterian Church, out in the country, and it's a good example of what we're doing in the Black Belt with renewal. Um, it had been abandoned. There was one lady whose family had been connected with that church. She kept the grass cut. She kept the cemetery up. Um, she did the best she could um, just to keep the thing standing. And she donated it to the Sumter County Historical Society, who donated it to the University of West Alabama. And UWA has moved it to their campus and resurrected it as their chapel on their campus. Okay, so um, again, instead of going with everything new, let's, let's save this 150-year-old structure. Um, and it's got a great story with it as well. Okay, so I know moving buildings isn't always the best option, uh, but it's, when it's abandoned out in the countryside, it's going to get burned down at some point. So, um, so we went with that as well, and it has been put back together. And I would say that more than anything, um, churches have played a key role um, in the Black Belt. And from the introduction to Chapter 4, churches are the center of community life in many Black Belt towns and rural areas. Couples are married within their sacred walls, children are baptized in their holy waters, and loved ones are laid to rest in quiet plots that have surrounded houses of worship for almost 200 years. The stately marble and granite stones tell the story of early white settlers from Ireland, Scotland, Virginia, and the Carolinas, while unmarked graves of slaves hold 
secret the names and stories of those who accompanied their owners to the old southwest to build houses and churches and to plant cotton. The earliest denominations in the regions were Episcopalians, Presbyterian, Methodists, and Baptists, with many congregations served by circuit-riding preachers. There was a Jewish community in Selma by 1830 and Demopolis by 1858, and today the Mennonite community is prominent in several Black Belt counties. Many congregations still meet in the structures built by early sailors. There's simply not enough people to warrant the destruction of the original building to build larger sanctuaries. And in some areas, the congregations of individual churches are so small that worshipers are members of multiple churches, dubbing themselves Babdameth the Presbypelians in order to keep the doors open. Um, and this happens in a lot of places. They're all confirmed, baptized, whatever you have to do. Okay. And here's the temple. Um, in Selma as well, okay, and of course cemeteries are also highly um, uh, featured, especially Live Oak in um, Live Oak in Selma, okay. Our, I think Robin and I would both agree this is probably our personal favorite. He's either not paying attention to me or he's disagreeing. I can't tell. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Um, and this is the Mount Nebo Cemetery in Clark County, which fortunately is very hard to find. Um, and you have to get somebody to take you there because it has been um, vandalized some. But um, these are concrete um, masks made uh, while the people were living and then put on their graves after, after they died. This is an African-American cemetery. We do feature writers, uh, Billie Jean Young on the left, and of course, y'all know Catherine Tucker Wyndham on the right. Just my personal thank you to Robin. Um, I said we can't do a book about writers in the Black Belt if we don't do include Mary Ward Brown and Catherine Tucker Wyndham. The problem was they had passed away, and Robert had not photographed them. And so he was kind enough to let one other photographer's picture show up in the book, um, which was Jerry Siegel, and he got permission to use Jerry Siegel's pictures of Catherine Tucker Wyndham and Mary Ward Brown. And the written word is really important in the Black Belt, especially in a region that for so long had a lot, really high illiteracy rates. Um, but if you look at a lot of the authors from Alabama, there's a Black Belt connection in some way. And so we feature several of those in the book, um, as well as musicians. Um, the last third of the book is dedicated to writers, musicians, artists, and that's because of the influence of Black Belt Treasures in getting the book put together. Um, and one thing that's unique about artists in the Black Belt, um, most of them are not what we would consider formally trained artists. They are out, outsider artists, but in the Black Belt they're majority, so I guess that makes them the insider artists in the Black Belt. Um, but what they do is they see something in their head. They can't afford the materials to paint that or to sculpt that, so they go find what they need. Okay, um, and you see this in, in um, artists like the Tin Man on the left from from Selma. Um, we do have some artists working in uh, more traditional work. The Munozes on the right do glass work, um, but of course the G's Ben Quilters are a fantastic example, right, of taking what you have to make what you need. And that's really one of the things that's my favorite part of the Black Belt. Um, and what makes the Black Belt especially strong um, culturally. And then, of course, food. You can't forget food, right? Um, lots of great people doing great things with food. Still your wonderful meat and threes, which are my favorite. Give me a meat and three with some fried, fried okra every day, and I will be happy. Okay. But we've also got chefs um, and young people coming in doing things as well. And then on the right, um, we've got... Um, the Timalichi Barbecue Clubs, and if anybody has seen the Alabama, the Journey Proud series on Alabama Public Television about the Sumter County Barbecue Clubs, Timalichi is the one that's most featured. That's me, by the way, doing the, the narration with Joey Breitner on that, um, which is funny because I'm the expert on the barbecue clubs of Sumter County, but I'm vegetarian. Um, but the one on the right is Timalichi, which we feature a lot in that section. And then the final chapter, we end on a happy note. What's new? Okay, what are we doing in the Black Belt um, that still embraces the culture here but helps the people that live here as well? And so we've got um, on the left, Chip Spencer in Marion Junction is going to all organic farming. Um, and his wife, Laura, who um, makes all her own soaps and everything from her goat's milk with her goats and her bees and things like that. And then on the right is Pam Dorr with Hero in um, 
Hale County, and they work with affordable housing. Um, but they've also tried to create new industries, again, using what's local. So they said, you know what, we've got a lot of bamboo. It's invasive. It needs to be cut down anyway. Let's do something with it. And so they are selling bicycles made out of bamboo. And a lot of them are going to Italy. I don't know what's going on in Italy, but they want a lot of bicycles made out of bamboo in Italy. So, um, again, creating jobs with an industry with things that we already have available. And, again, the rural studio. And then on the right is the Pi Lab in Greensboro, um, which has gotten a lot of um, press as well. Um, it's, it's social. How do they do it? Food to encourage social dialogue, basically, because people sit down and they talk over food, right? Food's a good icebreaker. And then last but last not least, what's fun? Okay. Um, so the guy on the left, of course, is that Freddie Epp? Was that his name? Does um, bird dogs, which reminds me so much of my grandfather. And then on the right is Laura Spencer Milk and her goats to do her goat's milk products. And do not want to close without thanking Black Belt Treasures because they sponsored the book. Um, they really made the book happen. Um, we would not be here if not for them. And I encourage you, if you're ever headed down um, to the beach, swing over to Camden in Wilcox County and see them. They've been around 10 years. They represent 450 Black Belt artists. So they've really made helped Black art become a viable industry in the Black Belt. And 70% of the sale price goes back to the artist. So they have, I think they figured out, they've sent $1.2 million back to artists in the Black Belt. So they're doing great work. And they also have a website, so you can order online with Christmas coming up. So if you want your money to stay local, right, um, look for things like Black Belt Treasures um, to buy your gifts and things for people, because that's how your money has the best impact. So, and that's it. Recording today's session, so if you would please raise your hand, and either myself or Georgia Ann will pass you the microphone. Robin, you want to stand up here so in case I ask questions? Let's see, you'll be next. Um, from a geological perspective, um, you know, I understand how the say the Mississippi Delta. Uh, originated it and, and cotton, well now it's corn and soybeans mm -hmm. and so forth. But w where's the black belt geologically uh, originated from? Where did the, mm -hmm. you know, the, the fertile soil originate from? So um, that if there's something called Selma chalk, and if you've ever seen the white bluffs at Demopolis or Epps, um, that is a chalk layer. That was the old seashore 75 million years ago. So if somebody said, I got some oceanfront property in Demopolis 75 million years ago, they'd have been right. Um, but what happens is as the waves wash up, they were depositing these algae, a microscopic algae called coccolithophores, and they just cemented into this chalk. And for millennia after that, whenever anything died and settled on top of it, it didn't get percolated down through the soil. Um, you cannot put in a septic system in the white belt. You just can't because it doesn't. The the ground doesn't percolate. So, um, as trees would die and animals and plants, all that would settle down and kind of mat up and um, decompose. But it creates a really thick, rich soil rather than the nutrients getting pulled down into the groundwater and things like that. So it was just millions and millions of years of organic matter decaying on top of that that chalk band. So, right here. Okay. In the picture of the. Uh sharecropper cabin it looked like it had been a duplex because it looked like a door had been boarded up so was it two families when it was slave quarters and then converted into a single family dwelling i think a lot of sharecropper cabins were you know two families shared them um that one is on the Folsom, mm -hmm. Folsom. plantation more web homes, more web yeah. homes plantation which is one of the oldest farms in Alabama still in the same family. And they used to have hundreds of those cabins, but that's the yeah. one that's still standing there kind of preserving them. Okay, one thank of the you. Old buildings there, old farm buildings that you can see there. But um, I think a lot of those cabins had two families in them. 
And what was interesting about that one is when the main family home burned in the 30s, the family actually moved into the big house burned. They moved into that cabin, um, that particular one. So uh, that's a shock <laughs> right there. I assumed when you were reading about what the subject was today that it was going to be some of the customs in the black belt. And I brought a little key, a little card case that was given to me, and it belonged to a, a great aunt. And these, when the ladies went calling, they would leave a card. And I was interested in the date, uh, which reflects January the 4th, I believe, of 17, excuse me, of 18, thank you, 1883. <laughs> and her maiden name, and I am mystified as to whether it was given to her on the celebration of her 21st birthday. Uh, maiden name, and of course she, well, she married and had her children shortly thereafter, but were, were gifts of this kind of elegance given to young ladies uh, that they'd have to, as calling cards as the years went along? Um, calling cards were common, and somebody else may be able to speak a little, speak a little more to the cultural history of that, uh, but they had a nice engraved card that they would give, and um, if you went to somebody's house, that was how you announced your arrival and they would take the card in and say, this person, you know, has arrived. Um, that's a really very nice gift. Um, I don't know if there's, I don't know the significance of the 21st birthday at that time. Obviously, 21st birthday today, we know why that's important, but, um, ma'am. Um, then I have some hair jewelry. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't know if that was hair jewelry that was made from some beloved soul or if it was just... Hair jewelry that was made, but I have the Provence of where my grandmother and grandfather are in their early married years, and she has the necklace around her neck, mm -hmm. and uh, then some of the uh, uh, pieces that are uh, earrings. And when the ladies were widowed young in life, many times they would wear the the black jewelry, mm -hmm. and so I have a collection of this. Well, that's and that's then, wonderful, especially uh, intact. If you can a, find it intact. Episcopal. There, there was a an architect from New York by the name of um, I can't remember his name now, but anyway, he was hired and brought down to do the the carpenter uh, mm -hmm. Episcopal churches in the area, and uh, the one that's over in Cahaba mm -hmm. was designed by him, and then I think the Auburn Studio has has worked on it. Mm -hmm. But beautifully, beautifully constructed and and very, very, very. Similar lines, architectural. I don't believe okay. he designed them personally. I think they were based on designs in a book that he published. Up Church, is that his name? Mm -hmm. Up, yes. Up John. Up John. Up John. Up John. Mm -hmm. Up John. And he was a. He did design a building. He designed a house in Alabama. Yes, he did. Uh, but the, the churches were designed locally based on his plans. Yes. Anybody else have any questions either about the black belt or about the book as well, which Robin can help with? Yes, sir. She's got you. I understand that um, coal ash is being shipped into Uniontown mm -hmm. for disposal. Can you tell us anything about that and what's being done to, to counter that uh, kind of destruction? Um. Not much, really. That landfill was created actually just to take household waste, um, but because the, um, was it a TVA dam that burst? I think that was a holding pond that had that coal ash in it, and it flooded the river and they had to get it out. And so they offered a good deal to the Perry County Commission to take that, and the Perry County Commission accepted it. So, and it came in by rail car. Um, and I don't know if it's, they might be mostly done with, delivering it by this point because that that started four or five years ago i think um but it's been very bad um for the environment right around the landfill and the landfill was built um there was a lot of controversy and even just building the landfill and a lot of people in perry county fought it for a really long time um, but the county commission 
had the final say and they voted to do it. After that, several of those county commissioners lost their jobs. They were voted out, but um, by that point, the, the landfill is going in. So um, unless the household waste landfill is taking appropriate steps to mitigate that, it should have gone to the landfill at Amel in Sumter County, which is a toxic waste landfill. Unfortunately for the Black Belt, because that chalk does not percolate water, it's the perfect spot to put in a landfill. And that's really unfortunate for an area that's got very low property values um, and is already very poor. Um, so when a, when a landfill company shows up and they have a lot of money and you ge geologically you're in the right place to do it, um, you end up with, with other people's garbage from New York and Washington and Virginia being trains, brought in by train um, and, and dumped there. So, and and I don't I don't know what steps they're taking to mitigate the coal ash, but I know it has poisoned a lot of the water um, in the area right around that. So, I mean, and I believe me, if there's something I could do, I wish I could. <laughs> so it's it's really sad, really sad, because we lived in Perry County before we moved to to Livingston, so we were very familiar um, with that. So, anybody else? Are there any more questions? Don't be shy. Are there any plans to either develop industry or improve agriculture so that people could be more successful there? Um, agriculture, yes, they're definitely working on that, and um, and mostly that's just people taking it upon themselves. But they're trying to move into those niche markets, with, especially with different types of organic farming. Of course, the Black Belt is a great place for catfish um, because the water doesn't percolate. So catfish ponds are great. We've got a lot of cattle, and we've got a lot of timber, and we address that um, in the book. As far as industry. Um, the, the the workforce is just not there for that really um, and there's a lot of background information that it would take me about an hour to explain to you and I won't do that to everybody but um, a lot the industry is just probably not going to happen honestly it can be small industries but there's not going to be um, the workforce labor skills are just not there um, to do to do big industry so um, we you know different universities and places do workforce development programs, you know, to aim at specific things like, for instance, the Mercedes plant in Tuscaloosa. So um, UWA is training people, you know, to work there. But it, it's almost the, the industry has to be willing to gamble to come in there to then hope that another group will pick up and train workers specifically for their industry. And a lot of industries aren't going to take that gamble. So, um, and it's really unfortunate. If you look, for instance, at Sumter County, in, a one, in about a two-mile square area, we have an interstate uh, the Tom Bigby, the Tin Tom, Tom Bigby Waterway, um, a railroad bridge, and a major U.S. highway. I mean, just within a couple miles of each other. If you were going to put a, an industry somewhere, that's where you do it because the transportation is phenomenal, but the workforce isn't there. And partly that's just due to low population numbers, but it's also due to um, um, educational training as well so agriculture yes they're working on that and I think that's probably the best way they need to go um, but industry it, you have to be real careful about what kind of industry you want to try to pull in so. has there been a study done of how many of what percentage of the graduating seniors from high school return to some of these small towns like Thomasville Admore mm -hmm. some of these others uh, Currently, it, I don't know about high school graduates. Um, there have been studies about how many go to college, but usually once they go to college, they don't come back. Um, it's the brain drain, you know, that you're familiar with. Um, and again, unless they have family property there or a family business to come back to, um, there's just not a lot to do otherwise. And so, if if they go to college, which of course is what they try to get as many students to do as they can, but unfortunately for that, they're not coming back um, to the areas. Almost all these counties have suffered population declines over the last 30, 40 years, consistent population declines of 1,500 people every census. And when you only had 15,000 people in 2000, right, if you've lost 2,000 people since then, you know, it's, it's really noticeable. And it's mostly young people 
um, leaving. Uh, for a lot of the ones that are right in the heart of the Bight Belt, yes. Numbers per county or for the whole oh, per county. That's, so there are the populations of most of those counties. Um, Dallas County is larger, but you know Perry County, Greene County, Hale County, they're 10, 15, 18,000 people. Um, and they lose, like I said, about 1,500 people per census every 10 years. So Could you comment on land ownership patterns, corporate ownership versus private, latifundia versus small parcels and that sort of thing? What's the situation there today? Um, timber companies own a lot of land in the Black Belt because um, it's a great place to grow pine trees and you can get huge tracts of land and the, like I said, the, it's not expensive and the taxes, the county taxes at least, are just about non-existent on timber land. Um, we have lots of other large tracts of land devoted to hunting, actually, um, which is also great if you have timber land as well. You can also set up a hunting area also. Um, and the Black Belt is trying to promote itself as sort of a sportsman's paradise, uh, fishing, hunting, um, those kind of things. Um, cattle farming, um, you know, cattle fields obviously take up a large amount of space, but except for the timber companies who own large swaths of land, um, most of it is just individual farmers um, who own who own a lot of land. Or like um, Alabama Power, I think has some pretty good tracts of land as well. Um, but for the most part, it's the large ownership is either going to be timber companies or individual farmers, um, either for crop farming. But mostly, we don't have a lot of crop farming anymore. There's there's obviously still some, but it's just not as prevalent as it once was. It's mostly, like I said, cattle, catfish, and timber. I think cotton is still the number one cash crop in the Black Belt, although it's much diminished from what it was at its, in its heyday. Mm -hmm. Anybody else? All right, if there are no more questions, we'd like to thank our speaker again today. Everybody give her a round of applause. <laughs>